Thanks. Thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. I'd like to formally welcome you to the Caribou's third climate breakdown webinar. Um, thank you so much for joining us from wherever you are. Oh. I know that you, you know, may have different commitments today, but I think it really shows and um speaks to the interest that there is in terms of climate change and people wanting to not only learn more about climate change, but engage in these discussions where we could really, you know, get a idea of the problem and probably, you know, speak to some solutions. So I am Tyrell Gittens and I'm the coordinator and editor of the Cropper Foundation's Caribou Environmental News Network. If this is your first time participating in our Climate Breakdown webinar, it was launched in April alongside another webinar series called the State of the Environment webinar series. And basically these Climate Breakdown webinars are envisioned to be a space where we can bring together people to learn more about different facets of climate change. And as I would have said earlier on, you know, potentially discuss solutions on how we could tackle these issues. So of course, with the United Nations Climate Conference coming up in just a few days, COP28, we thought it would be more than important to facilitate you know, uh, edition of the Climate Breakdown webinar today. And with that, we have two very dynamic presenters with us this afternoon. So how the day will flow is that we will have presenting first, Dr. Kara Niles, then Ms. Sasha Chitan Singh, and then we will have a Q&A session. So be sure to write down your questions um, during the presentations and then you could ask them towards the end of the webinar when we have the Q&A session. Um, in terms of just a few house rules, if you can, you can keep your mic off just so you know we don't have any interruptions while the presenters are presenting, as well as you could keep your videos off as well, um, just to ensure that we you know, don't have any bandwidth issues this afternoon. So if you like, I saw Ms. Carol would have introduced herself as well. In the chat, you could put your name and where you are from, just so we have an idea of who are with us this afternoon. But so waste no time because I know we are all very busy individuals. I'd like to introduce our first presenter this afternoon, Dr. Kara Niles. Dr. Kara Niles is a lecturer at the Institute of International Relations at the University of the West Indies. His work focuses on problems that arise at the intersection of climate and energy policy. Dr. Niles has also been researching the link between industrial policy, international trade, and climate change in the Caribbean since 2008. But within the last five years alone, his research has also focused on assessing cultural industries as a pathway to low carbon and the circular economy growth. Dr. Niles is also the managing director of Koru Green Limited, a firm dedicated to commercializing creative content throughout the Caribbean. No doubt a very multi-talented individual, Dr. Niles is also a published poet and has been a certified youth worker for the past 23 years. He holds a bachelor degree in government along with minors in history and international relations from the University of the West Indies. He also has a master's in international law from the University of Aberdeen. So now let's welcome Dr. Kara Niles, who will lead us off this afternoon by discussing the most recent United Nations Environment Program adaptation report, which she would have also, you know, contributed to. Dr. Niles? Wow. Good afternoon, everyone. I was not, I didn't know you were going to read that. <laughs> okay, cool. Thanks so much for the introduction. I appreciate it. Um, my name is, yeah, so I am from the University of West Indies. Thank you so much. I'm going to jump right in to this presentation. Um, we have a lot of ground to cover and not heaps of time. 
So I uh, and I I want to I want to see if to have um as many discussions as we or as much discussion as we can, right? So um please tell me when you can um see the screen. Um I'm going to share my screen now. Let me know when you can see it. There we go. It should it should be on your screens um right now. Um, yes, we are seeing the present. You're seeing it, right? Yes, we are. That that's excellent. All right. So I'm jumping right in. They asked they asked me to cover a few things. I'm gonna to try to cover as much of those things as I as I possibly can. Welcome in advance as well to Shasha. Good to see you. It's been a while. Um and happy to see everybody here. I'm hoping to have a really good discussion. Looking forward to reading the introductions as soon as I'm finished here. What is climate adaptation? Do not want to assume everyone knows. Um, so essentially that is really referring to the adjustments in eco ecological, social, or uh, e or so economic, social, or ecological um, systems in response to actual or expected um, stimuli and the effects. In other words, we understand that climate change is happening and will happen even further. Uh, how do we change our systems to respond and prepare for that? Those are the, this is the key elements of climate change adaptation. Now, there are limits to how much we can change to environmental changes. Right. And when we hit those limits, well, that's where we confront loss, low losses and damages. And some of those losses will be loss of life. So these are serious limits to adaptation. Right. I'm going to be sharing with you some key highlights from of the United Nations Environment Program Adaptation Gap Report. I'm sharing with you within the context, this to be very clear, I am one of the lead authors of one of the chapters of the report. It's done by enormous, like I can't even, I can't tell you how many of them, but enormous ex experts from around the world, they gather us and they talk at length about um, the, the methods of how we prepare the report. This report was prepared by us surveying pretty much everything or uh, every well many if not all um adaptation policy in the world <laughs> at least that's what me, me and my team that's what we did and for our chapter because i was looking specifically at adaptation policy and planning and we were looking at the global picture for adaptation right so um what do we find? And I'm going to stick very, very closely to the official UN script here because they, um, again, they want they are trying to send the same message throughout the world. The, this report was recently launched, and they they want to make sure the the message in a, about the report is consistent. So, well, I understand why. Um, that's because this report is going to feed directly into COP28, which we can talk more about, uh, in the discussion period as well. The first thing that you should notice that um, progress on climate change adaptation is, is slowing. Some of us would say it's plateauing um, across all fronts, and it really should be accelerating. Now, this this is um a, a couple of just a couple of notes. I am not going to read slides. So if, if you are on the chat and you are visually impaired and you can't read, please put it in the chat um, for me. Just type that in the chat that I am visually impaired. Or, or, or I cannot read, um, either one, send me a private message and I will begin to read the slides. Otherwise, um, I think it'd be more efficient if, if I just speak to the slides and have you read them. Um, I think I think what's really, really key here is understanding that when we say that adaptation planning is slow and adaptation, it, climate, and progress in climate, climate adaptation is slowing, what we mean is that we're tracking adaptation pro um, projects and we're, we're tracking adaptation policies across the globe. They are slowing for two reasons. One, we are hitting a saturation point, 
uh, in some ways. Um, that means that almost every country in the world has an has an adaptation policy, which is really which is good news. But um, it's also not great news that we're slowing in terms of the 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 implementation of it or the amount of adaptation policies that we that we're seeing happening in terms of those adaptation policies being updated. Um, it's good that almost every country in the world has one. It's not so good that we're seeing a slowing in terms of the finance, in terms of activities related to planning, and it definitely is not good that we're seeing a, a slowdown in terms of implementation. That means that when that when climate impacts actually happen, our ability to respond to climate impacts is going to be curtailed. That's a nice way of saying it, the particular directory. Um, but as you can see on the screen, it can it can make adaptation um, more difficult, which, which will deepen the climate crisis. The other thing to note um, is in terms of our ability to, to pay for the changes that, that we see ahead of us, that's, that's critical. So in terms of the, the cost of adaptation, when we modeled it out in this report, we realized that, that the, the range is between $215 billion and $387 billion. Uh, I always have to say with a B, um, per year in this decade, you know, um, just in, in the decade that we're currently in, um, that's $387 billion per year is what we believe is going to cost. And that's when we look at all of the, the if you, if anybody wants to talk about more, more about how we do this, in the, we can do so in any conversation after, but in brief, it's when we look at what countries say they want to do in their national nationalism and contributions their NDCs and their adaptation planning documents. Right? We have a bit of ground to cover, so I'm not gonna move too slowly. I do, however, want to point out that the adaptation finance needs of developing countries are 10 to 18 times as great as the international public finance flows. That's that's more than half the that that's more fifty percent more than we thought that it was when we began the study. Um, this is significant um, because someone needs to pay for adaptation. Let's let's be very very clear. We have moved past the point where we are arguing about the science of climate change. That's not the critical problem right now. Not and I'm not saying that. That, that climate science isn't important. The critical problem, however, is not proving whether or not science, climate change is happening or will happen. That's not, that's not really the, the crux of the concern right now. The concern is who's gonna pay for it. The concern is how are countries, particularly the, the most vulnerable countries going to be able to adjust to it? That's what the, the crux of the debates are, that's where the negotiations are. It's not about, we're not arguing about if this is happening, if it's not happening. That's a side argument that a few still seem to really want to have, but the majority of the community of nations have certainly shifted their focus to discussing the economics of climate change and the politics of climate change. Those two areas are really the, the, the crux of the focus right now. But what we're seeing in terms of who's going to pay for this, um, we're seeing an adaptation gap growing to as large as 366 billion US dollars per year. And, and there's a reason for this, right? Adaptation finance actually decreased and this was within the context, just to be very clear, this is within the context of countries promising to increase the adaptation uh, finance flows after the, 20, the 2019, um, after COP26 that happened in Glasgow, 
You already remember that that cup meeting. Countries came together in Glasgow and said, well, we're going to increase our funding and decided we're going to increase adaptation finance support around $40 billion per year by 2025. That's what they said then. Right now, in, in 2021, rather, it decreased. That should concern everybody. Because the changes that we need to see happening, they will cost money to implement. So while when we when we relate to the planning and implementation side of things, um what we're seeing right now, as I as I mentioned before, is a plateauing in terms of progress on uh adaptation planning and implementation. What well, but it is good news, as I said before, that five out of six countries now have a national adaptation planning instrument, right? But we need to get to full global coverage, and that progress is slowing. That progress needs greater support. And where we're seeing some progress actually happening is, is with regard to adequacy and effectiveness. Right. Um, so countries are and this is a good this is a good this is good news. Countries are focusing um a little bit more on how the the how adequately the the, the adaptation policies cover uh, um adaptation risk and the effectiveness of the actual instruments to to cover those risks. Uh they're focusing more on that, which is good. We need a lot more focus, however, on implementation, right? Um so all is not lost because we do have some progress. Right. I can speak more about, about uh, how this progress is spread across the world as well. Um, if persons want to talk about it in, in the question and answer segment. Um, uh, I want to see, is are these slides moving for you all? Yeah, okay, cool. I think they are now. All right, so the other thing that uh, I really want to point out really quickly is when you have adaptation planning and adaptation, in the implementation of adaptation plans slowing down, what you will have on the back end of that is more loss and damage. So uh, I put the study in the in the in the in the slides for those of you that want to go check it out. It's a 2022 study, and what they found was that around $525 billion have been lost because of climate change in the last two decades. And economic losses cut GDP growth by one full percentage each year in the most vulnerable countries. That is significant. That, that affects people's lives and their livelihoods. So, we need to study the economic impacts of loss and damage even more to get better numbers. But what we're seeing so far is, is deeply worrying. So a couple of things that, that I really want to take a minute and, and highlight is we do need to look at more innovative ways to deliver finance. And number one is really being clear about the fact that we need to invest in adaptation and mitigation now because investing in adaptation and mitigation now actually reduces the um the loss and damage that we experience later i think that that's really critical um i know sasha is going to talk more about loss and damage i'll study some of that for her but i i just i can't stress this enough the the example on the screen as you see, is that if we invest 16 billion per year in agriculture now, we can save what 70 million people from starving or chronic hunger because of climate impacts. Those numbers are going to get more stark the longer we wait to take action. Right? And that's really important. Um, so it it's really clear to us as well that what we've done so far is insufficient. The agreements that we have so far, insufficient. It's great that we have agreed that we have, we're going to have a loss and damage fund. It's great that that the operational rules, that we've seen a lot of progress on it. Well, we've seen 
progress on the operational rules and how it's going to work and th that it's going to operate as a, as an established fund. We we we're happy to see that progress, um. But we need again equitable attention being paid to mitigation and adaptation, and we need adapt adaptation finance in particular to increase significantly, right? And not just in words, but in reality, because the last time countries said they were going to increase it, it actually did the opposite. So a couple more things. I think we need to begin to look at solutions that we haven't explored fully yet, right? And some of the solutions include using um, more domestic expenditure, um, and, but but the ability of many of the most vulnerable countries to use domestic expenditure is extremely limited. Using international finance and private sector finance more, um, and directing funds from remittances toward climate finance. You know that is also an idea that I think needs to be explored, but also making finance more finance available to to small and medium sized enterprises particularly those from developing countries and particularly those from developing countries doing work on climate smart or carbon neutral technologies that can help to shift towards low carbon growth or yeah it or yeah no, i'll put it that, that yeah definitely or at least con companies that are doing work that make their economies more resilient, that make their, their societies more resilient as well. I think that's really important. And of course, the, the ability to reform the global financial architecture, um, as proposed in the British Young Initiative, um, if you haven't yet... Um, read the, the one or two pages that was released by the government of Barbados on this, I'd encourage you to. Um, I think it's an important initiative. Uh, if, if persons want to talk more about that, I'm trying to finish before my other time, so we have a bit of time left to talk about it after. If persons want to talk about it, I think we should. The other thing that I would like to say um, is that we need to, and I I, I, I phrase it by, like that, by the way, it's because I'm not really now. I'm not now speaking about the report, right? I would like to see us focus more on economic and non-economic loss and damages. So when you you, you heard um, Tyrell when you introduced me talking about my research in our cultural industries as a a pathway to low economic, sorry, to a pathway to low carbon economic growth. Um, and one of the reasons I look at, uh, at, at the culture industries is because if you look at the uh, pathways that you can grow your economy and green your economy, many cultural industries are a way that you can do that. However, we also need to look at the flip side now. What are the cultural impacts of climate change? What are the non-economic impacts of climate change? What are the non-economic losses that people are experiencing? What are the losses that they experience when they have to move their entire homes and they have to move their families? When, when families are really, really impacted negatively, like so in Greenville, when when we visited, um, people. This is after the horrendous floods that we had a couple of years ago in Greenville in Trinidad and Tobago. People spoke about being afraid of rain. What is what is the real impact of that? So there's also a real need to focus on economic and non-economic loss and damage. But let, let me wrap this up by just saying that I think this year, when we when COP28 happens, the, the report is really clear that the work that we've done is just calling for new momentum on adaptation and concrete progress that really helps us to support the most vulnerable. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. Um, my email address is on the screen. 
Um, so is my IG address um, for those of you that don't do email anymore. Um, thanks so much for your time again. Thanks for having me and um, looking forward to the discussion. Thanks so much, Dr. Niles. I think for that very eye-opening presentation. Now, I would have made some notes um, about things that stood out from your presentation, and I hope that our attendees are also doing that so that they could ask questions at the end of the session. But I think one of the standouts for me in regards to adaptation is that progress is slowing, and we know adaptation is one of those pillars of climate um, resilience. And the issue of climate change is only intensifying in a lot of regards. So I think that is something that people probably love to, you know, um, dig a little bit deeper in at the end of the session, as well as just that gap in terms of uh, global South countries, in terms of the cost of adaptation. For them. So folks, again, please, you know, make notes just like I have been doing for Karen at the end of the webinar. And we'll also share the adaptation report as well. Um, and the resources that we, for those who, you know, have attended previous webinars, we usually share the presentations as well as make the recordings and other resources available. So I'll also be sure to include that report there as well. So now I'd like to move along to our second presenter for today, Ms. Sasha Jatansing. Ms. Sasha Jatansing is a loss and damage expert at Climate Analytics Caribbean, which is based in Trinidad and Tobago. At CA Caribbean, Ms. Jatansing works with Caribbean small island developing states to address critical issues related to loss and damage, adaptation, climate finance, and climate justice. She has a strong background in environmental and climate policy, climate finance, participa participatory governance, grants management, capacity building, and science communication. Ms. Jatan Singh, holds a master's is an, in environmental policy and regulation from the London School of Economics and Political Science, a master of engineering in environmental engineering from the University of Auckland. And she also holds a bachelor of science in environmental science from the University of Toronto with honors. She has also worked with the Commonwealth Climate Finance Hub Global Green Growth Institute, the United Nations Development Program, the Caribbean Natural Resources Institute, the University of the West Indies, and the government of Trinidad and Tobago on climate change and sustainable development issues. So I don't think, you know, there is anyone that will be better to lead us in the second part of our discussion this afternoon on climate loss and damage as we look forward to COP28. And for those who would have followed the conference last year, which I am sure Mr. Tansing will speak a bit more to, there was the development of a loss and damage fund. So it will be interesting if, as Karen would have stated in regards to previous goals set for adaptation, if she'll also be able to share some, you know, spotlight on loss and damage. But that's for... Uh, Mr. Tansing to do, and I will now allow her to, you know, take over the, the floor from here. Thanks so much, Tyrell. And it's always um incredibly embarrassing to hear your bio being read word for word. <laughs> I thought it would have been shortened. And um nice to see you, Karen. Karen and I um we've worked together and we actually went to school in New Zealand together. By the way, we didn't know each other then. Um, but yeah, it's like a very small, small space, this climate and environmental space here in the Caribbean, um, not and even small in Trinidad. So I just want to thank Karen for his his presentation on the adaptation gap report and just outlining the key, you know, the key messages on the need for ramped up adaptation action. It's not only focusing on, you know, developing plans and policies, but it's implementation and ensuring that we have the means of implementation. So finance, technological um, support and so forth to deliver on adaptation action. And um, what's quite important is this link 
between adaptation and mitigation as well and loss and damage. And Karen pointed that out very starkly because if it is that we don't have um, mitigation and adaptation action occurring at the levels that we need to ensure that that you know the temperature goal is within the 1.5 degrees Celsius limit as stated in the, the Paris Agreement, the type of loss and damage expected, especially for highly vulnerable countries like small island developing states, um, could be, you know, the, the, the scale is something we can't even envisage um, because we don't know. There's a lot we don't know about loss and damage. But over this last year alone, I think countries around the world has been experiencing loss and damage to a degree nobody knew. Um, and I think quite recently for, for the Caribbean, we have been experiencing, you know, heat waves and, you know, that we never knew existed, right? And what, how, if that is going to be the new norm for us, how are we going to adapt to this change in climate, to this change in reality? And can we even adapt to that, um, to the amount of heat stress for, and drought and so forth? Um, that we we might be experiencing in the future. So what I will do is I'll start my presentation and it will be focused on loss and damage and focus is, um, is what is the outlook at COP28 on loss and damage. So I just wanted to know if everybody could see my screen. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so just a bit about climate analytics. Um, so we are a global climate science and policy institute uh, engaged around the world in, in driving and supporting climate action aligned to the 1.5 degrees Celsius warming limit. And we connect science and policy to empower vulnerable countries in international climate change negotiations and inform national planning with targeted research analysis and support. And we have offices around the world and our newest office is actually right here in, in the Caribbean, in Trinidad and Tobago. And our focus is on providing negotiation support to SIDS um, through the Alliance of Small Island States and, and CARICOM and um, also to the Pacific SIDS as well. And we also provide policy legislative uh, support and implementation support on key climate um, action areas such as adaptation, um, loss and damage, just transition uh, and climate justice as well. So, so just a bit about who climate analytics is and noting that our Climate Analytics Caribbean is our newest office and it is focused on SIDS and Caribbean um, climate policy, climate action and so forth. So in terms of the, the outline for the presentation, I wanted to just give a, you know, an overview of, of what is loss and damage, what is the history of the of loss and damage in the UNFCCC process. Then also talking about, you know, COP27 and then what is the outlook at um, COP28. And you know, I, I would say most people here would have an inkling of um, what happened in loss and damage and why loss and damage and particularly loss and damage is finance is quite important. Um, so in terms of, of understanding loss and damage, I think it's it's interesting that you all should note that there is there's actually no official definition of loss and damage anywhere. However, um, loss and damage could be broadly um, considered to be the negative impacts of climate change arising from, arising from um, insufficient or inadequate mitigation and adaptation action or in spite of them. So as, um, as Karen would have outlined um, mitigation is any sort of action that reduces greenhouse gas emissions and adaptation actions help to build adaptive capacity and also build climate resilience in you know, communities, in um, ecosystems, in, in economy, ec economic sectors and so forth. But what we're seeing here is that, uh, is that loss and damage 
um, uh, all these negative impacts that that happen in spite of and due to insufficient mitigation and adaptation action. And um, I think it's it's important to to note here that um, that loss and damage is um, is and and that that loss and damage is it it's it has always been and now it's at the forefront um it's because it's it's firmly centered in being a, a climate justice matter and that's because um you know the the most vulnerable countries and communities such as and and in particular um small island developing states like here in the Caribbean we've had the least historical responsibility for greenhouse gas emissions and yet we're experiencing the brunt of of um adverse effects of climate change right so this is why loss and damage and the need for for loss and damage finance to address how you know how do we deal with loss and damages is, is so important um and loss and damage could be either you know, extreme weather events, so, you know, hurricanes, flooding, heat waves, droughts, or it could be slow onset events, and that could be, um, you know, desertification, sea level rise, loss of biodiversity, um, or ocean acidification. And um, as Karen mentioned, loss and damages could be either economic losses and damages or non-economic losses and damages. And um, when we talk about economic loss and damage that's where it's you, you it you you it's easier to assign a, a monetary value to the losses and damages due to the negative impacts of climate change so basically that's any sort of you know goods or services or resources anything that you can assign a monetary value to so you know, economic loss and damage could be um, rebuilding of infrastructure and property, for example, or, or the damages caused by, um, you know, flooding to and, and the damages caused um, to infrastructure like highways, um, uh, I would say power generation lines and so forth. Or it could affect um, income. So that could be loss of revenue um, from agricultural yields due to immense flooding. And um, we saw that happen uh, happen last year in Pakistan, where billions of dollars were lost due to those those immense flooding in Pakistan, um, in the agricultural sector. Um, non economic losses and damages are a lot more difficult to to assign a monetary value to. Um, these are things that are more intrinsic, you know. For example, health and and well being you know lives also looking at at loss of territory um cultural heritage indigenous and local knowledge and then also looking at loss of biodiversity and loss of ecosystem services so how can we how can we adequately quantify these the value of of ecosystem services for example or of cultural identity and cultural heritage it's quite difficult to do but these are these are aspects um that are being really negatively impacted due to climate change that we can't just not consider anymore because it really part really forms part of of um, our identity and culture and so forth things that are a lot more intrinsic and intangible so, so you see how complex this issue of loss and damage is. You're seeing it is a climate justice issue. It's difficult to, to um to quantify what how do you, it's difficult to assess, but still we need to have dedicated resources and and dedicated um interest into developing what are the proper methodologies, ensuring that we have proper financing to address loss and damage as well. And um I think what like Karen made this link between adaptation and loss and damage and it's very important to, to bring out here and for 
you know, AOSIS, the Alliance of Small Island States, they consider adaptation as a priority because it's a means to minimize loss and damage due to increasing negative impacts of climate change to small islands. And I think that's quite important because, you know, loss and damage occurs where the when the limits to adaptation, and Karen mentioned that a bit, has been breached, right? And the focus, especially over the last year, has been on, on um, loss and damage and then on mitigation and adaptation. Adaptation hasn't been, you know, as, and it's not only last over the last year, but for, I would say, m many years, it hasn't really gotten the the um level of, of interest or support needed because we're realizing that you can't just do mitigation alone reducing greenhouse gases without adaptation right because what um what in understanding climate policy and climate action we're realizing that mitigation adaptation and then minimizing averting and addressing loss and damage. Those are the three pillars of climate action. And one does not act, you know, um, in, in, um, in silos. So they're all mutually, um, you know, synergistic and supportive of each other. And adaptation, I would say, is incredibly important in helping highly vulnerable countries highly vulnerable communities like um, small islands here in the Caribbean deal with loss and damage. So I just wanted to make that link with why, um, with why adaptation is critical and especially in this discussion on loss and damage and, um, and, and especially um, when we talk about climate justice. So in terms of the, the history of loss and damage in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC process, um, loss and damage isn't a new, you know, term or terminology. It was actually introduced in a proposal by Vanuatu when the UNFCCC was being negotiated in 1991. Um, that uh, was, of course, um, it was rejected. However, loss and damage still... Um, interest in loss and damage and advocacy, especially strong advocacy by small islands and also by um, least developing countries ensure that loss and damage continued to make its way into the, the UNFCCC process. But it was only until, sorry about that, it was only until um, 2007 at COP13 where um, where loss and damage was actually um, consideration of, of um, a means to address loss and damage was launched. And then some years later, going now into COP19 in 2013, the Warsaw International Mechanism on Loss and Damage was established. Moving forward to 2015 at COP21, the Paris Agreement was adopted. And this is quite pivotal because it now includes a standalone article on loss and damage, Article 8, um, ensuring the permanence of loss and damage in the UNFCCC process. So it's no longer, you know, loss and damage being considered and so forth. It's now, it's, it's, it's now uh, an article. There's legal standing in international um, law for loss and damage. Moving forward to 2019 at COP25, the Santiago Network on Loss and Damage was established. And this was quite important because this network is expected to provide technical assistance to highly vulnerable countries on how to um, address loss and damage. And then of course, last year um, at COP27, a loss and damage fund and funding arrangements were agreed, right? So this was, a huge, this is of huge historical significance because developing countries, particularly SIDS, have been, you know, advocating strongly for the need for dedicated um, loss and damage financing and the need for a responsive loss and damage fund to, to start to, to address the, the needs of, of developing countries. 
to deal with loss and damage. And then um, in December, in the next few weeks, um, it's expected at COP28 that, that the loss and damage fund will be operationalized. Um, so then just a bit about what happened last year at COP27. And that's, um, you know, everybody talks, calls it the, the loss and damage COP. And that's because, you know, this was where probably the last day was when a, a loss and damage fund and funding arrangements were formally agreed to be established. Um, and this is from, you know, very intense negotiations uh, and intense calls from developing countries for the need for, you know, um, dedicated financing to deal with loss and damage. And in terms of, of this decision, um, this loss and damage fund is quite important because now we have a fund for loss and damage that forms part of the UN climate architecture. And um, it responds to calls from de developing countries to have a dedicated finance mechanism, which is funded by developing countries who are the, you know, who are historically the largest greenhouse gas emitters. Um, however, the decision to, to establish the loss and damage fund and funding arrangements, um, it doesn't actually state which countries should contribute and it, does, and it doesn't make any connection between, you know, the link between um, provision of finance and historical emissions. So, so it's quite interesting that it does not include that, um, but, but it was important that this had to happen this way or else developed countries were not going to agree to a fund. Um, that being said, that being said, um, COP27 was, you know, everybody will remember it because the loss and damage fund was, and funding arrangements was established. However, we have a fund, but we don't know anything about it in terms of how is it going to be governed? Where is it going to be located? What are the you know eligibility um, criteria to access the fund? Where are the sources and so forth? Instead, um, at COP27, a transitional committee was set up to make recommendations on all these issues. Um, and they would meet and hash out these issues and develop recommendations for parties to adopt at COP28. So, you know, most of the heavy lifting happened this year in COP20, um, this year through the work of the Transitional Committee. And this committee comprised um, 24 members, which included, um, you know, members from developed countries and developing countries as well, including small island developing states. Um, so we had, we had um, Antigua and Barbuda and the Maldives who represented SIDS. Um, on the transitional committee. And in terms of the, the loss and damage outlook at COP28, so I think a big, um, one of the biggest, I would say, um, topics will be, you know, the, the loss and damage fund and, and, um, and the oper operationalization of, of the fund. And this really, is underpinned by the work of the transitional committee. And as I said, they had intense negotiations, a packed schedule for this year. Um, initially, the transitional committee was supposed to have three meetings. Um, of course, that did not happen. Um, they had two more meetings. The last meeting, TC5, concluded at the in the first week of November, and those were immensely heated negotiations. Um, but they were able to come up with recommendations for the loss and damage fund. And um, and this would will now be forwarded to COP28 for consideration. There were also two workshops organized by the UNFCCC Secretariat. And also there was a loss and damage ministerial that happened um that happened in September around or in the wings of the United Nations General Assembly. So you could see just how I would say that there was such 
heavy interest in loss and damage and loss and damage finance for this year. So, you know, the, the transitional committee, they had to they, they had to have an outcome. They had to have outcomes where there would be recommendations that would go to the to, to the COP. Um, so these recommendations include a draft governing instrument for the fund. And um, you know, every, these recommendations were not without some deep compromises um from you know developing countries and uh, uh, in particular so developing countries have long been calling for the need for a, a um independent fund that is part of the UNFCCC um uh it's it's a operating entity of the financial mechanism of the UNFCCC um and that it would be responsive and fit for purpose to ensure that it meets the needs of, of developing countries dealing with loss and damage. So, you know, one of the recommendations is that the loss and damage fund will actually be an operating entity of the financial mechanism of the UNFCCC. And this is important because it is accountable to the COP, the Conference of the Parties, um, to the UNFCCC and the CME, which is the Conference of the Parties um, saving as the meeting of, of the parties to the Paris Agreement. And why this is important is you have this loss and damage fund and it has to report to the COP and the CME. And who you're basically reporting to is parties to countries. Because if it was, you know, if it, let's say it was uh, um, housed under another organization, you may not have that that level of transparency. It would now have to operate within the remit of that organization's, you know, operational policies and procedures. Now, one of the biggest um, compromises that developing countries had to had to make was that they agreed that um, the World Bank will serve as interim host of the fund. And this was something that um, to have the, the World Bank serve as, as, as host was something that developed countries and particularly the US was pushing for. And developing countries wanted to have an independent fund um, for an uh, independent fund. However, um, the recommendations going to the COP is that the World Bank will serve as trustee and interim host of the fund for four years, subject to conditions being met. And this is where developing countries listed out a set of, of criteria that the World Bank had to meet. Um, because I, I think people would know, you know, the track record of the World Bank for uh, on doing development and climate work. Um, and then also looking at the fact that, that accessing funds from the World Bank, um, it, it can't be done through direct access. It has to be done, done through an intermediary. So what will happen to those countries who aren't members of the World Bank? And then looking at, um, at transaction and operation and administrative fees, the World Bank tends to have incredibly high administrative fees. Um, I think at, at TC5, they propose that it should be about 24%. And that's almost a quarter. And then how much money is actually going now to you know, the most vulnerable communities and countries that are dealing with loss and damage. So these are issues that, that will be you know, discussed further at COP because you have to remember the transitional committee um, provided recommendations, but once you're at COP, countries are free to, um, to negotiate and to decide on what is, is most suitable. Um, so the recommendations that that the transitional committee proposed might be completely different at the end of, of the COP on on what how this fund would look like and how it's going to be operationalized. Um, another important uh, recommendation is that the the fund will have an independent secretariat with its own legal personality, and this is important because it will allow. Um, the board to you know negotiate and conclude and enter into a hosting arrangement with the World Bank, um, which is which is important because now the the fund won't be um, you know it, it it won't be privy to having to to um, to 
to uh, abide by the World Bank organizational proceed and, and operational procedures and policies, it would be it would be um something that's suitable for the the loss and damage fund. And what, uh, as I said, developing countries have been calling for is the fact that this fund has to be fit for purpose. It has to be responsive and it has to ensure that there's timely and direct access to, to countries that are, are dealing with loss and damage. Um, and interestingly, there was nothing on the scale of the fund. So how much money should this fund have? Um, developing countries have uh, proposed and from recent, you know, recent studies were done that there should be a flow of 100 billion a year um, for the loss and damage fund. Of course, developed countries were like, no, we're not taking that. And instead, the, the text in the recommendations that were proposed are that developing developed countries are asked to take the lead in providing startup finance for the fund. And also developed countries are urged to continue to provide support while other countries are encouraged to do so on a voluntary basis. So you see that we don't have anything about historical responsibility. We don't have anything about how much money is the fund going to actually have. And we don't have who is going to, to um, contribute to the fund in the long term. So I think these are some interesting outcomes. And uh, I think it's something to follow closely um, while when COP uh, is going on in the next few weeks to see what is the outcome. Another issue that's of importance related to loss and damage is um, you know, negotiations around the Santiago network. And as I said, the Santiago network on loss and damage is really there to, it was established to catalyze technical assistance for, um, for dealing with with loss and damage in developing countries and last year the COP actually adopted terms of reference for the Santiago network and established uh, the advisory board and it was expected that at the Bonn climate conference this year in June um, SB 58 um, they would countries would have decided on on who the host would be and and then that and that would be recommended for consideration and approval at COP. However, that didn't happen. So now um, it's expected that, you know, in the next few weeks, the a host would be selected. Um, currently, there are two proposals for the host of the Santiago Network, and that's the Caribbean Development Bank, CDB, sorry, and also a joint proposal by the UN Office for Project Services and the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. So I think this is um, of interest, especially for SIDS and for the Caribbean, because we have, we actually have um, a regional organization, the Caribbean Development Bank, who's, who've submitted a proposal um, for being the host of the Santiago Network. And, and this proposal, this has been endorsed by CARICOM and also by the Alliance of Small Island um, States, EOSIS. So it's another, I would say, issue to, to look out for um, at COP. And lastly, another key issue at COP is the first global stock take. And um, the, the objective of the, the Global Stock Take or the GST is to measure progress in achieving the long-term go goals on the Paris Agreement, um, which covers mitigation, adaptation, and means of implementation and support. And parties also in agree to include loss and damage in the GST process. And the first GST will actually conclude at COP28. Um, it took place over um, a two-year period. Um, where there were, you know, technical inputs and so forth. Right now, we're in the final phase, the political um, phase of it. And the GST will identify overall gaps and opportunities to achieve the Paris Agreement. And, um, you know, case in point, the synthesis report for the GST was published in September 2023. And um, it's, it's really a stark reminder that the world is off track to achieve the 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature goal. And basically, that's what Karen has been saying in the adaptation gap report in terms of, of adaptation and the need for, 
for um, augmented and enhanced financial flows for adaptation action. Um, the, the GST political outcome at COP28 is an opportunity to course correct and enable more ambitious NDCs and transformational climate action and support. And you're probably wondering, well, why is this first global stock take so important? And how does it relate to, to loss and damage? Well, what we're seeing here is that, you know, we're, we're all the, the studies and so forth is pretty much showing that, you know, we're, we're off track to achieving the, the goals of the Paris Agreement, right? The, there's a, a annual emissions gap report that UNAP um, released yesterday that basically says that, you know, with um with all the the NDCs the nationally determined contributions um that have been agreed the world is on track actually to uh 2.5 to 2.9 degree um warming degree celsius warming above pre-industrial levels right so so that's quite scary since even at 1.5 degrees celsius <laughs> there will be immense adverse impacts to small island developing states, to the Caribbean, right? So what we need is more ambitious climate, uh, you know, climate commitments and implementation and, the, and ensuring that we have the finance and means of implementation to do the, to do the type of, of transformational systems-wide climate action needed. Um, to ensure that we're able to 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 achieve the one point five degree temperature goal of the Paris Agreement, um, basically countries could use the first GST as a prior as an opportunity to prioritize the need for for um you know finance for the loss and damage fund, and in particular, um, SIDS and developing countries have been calling for the need for grants and not loans, because this is loss and damage we're talking about, right? We, you know, we're dealing with losses to, to infrastructure, losses to agriculture, ecosystems, you know, loss of territory. What, we, need, we need grants and we need quick, easy access to, to this funding to deal with with loss and damage not this shouldn't be something that that should be concessional like like we don't um we shouldn't have loans um so it's really an opportunity to highlight why we need loss and damage financing and why we need to this um loss and damage fund that is fit for purpose responsive timely and meets the needs of developing countries and and communities as well um and I think yeah I think that's it for me so I just want to say thank you so much and I for you know um allowing me to present on loss and damage and the loss and damage outlook at, at COP28 and also um if you have any questions I look forward to the Q&A session so thanks so much we definitely do appreciate you taking the time to join us this afternoon and share your expertise as it relates to the matter. And some things that would have stood out to me is how adaptation is as a means to reducing loss and damage in you know, a connection between the two issues that yourself and Dr. Niles would have presented on this afternoon. And you would have highlighted the dynamic that adaptation hasn't really been you know, elevated as much in the discourse regarding loss and damage, as well as some of the work that is being done on the fund and where that fund could potentially be taken at COP28. So now it's the opportunity for everyone, the attendees, to be able to ask, you know, questions that you would like. And I see Mr. Ambaran has his hand up. So that's all fine. You can go ahead and ask. Thank you very much, uh, Tyrell, and um, fantastic presentations by both Dr. Niles and Sasha. Um, some some comments. Um, um, first, uh, in terms of Dr. Niles' presentation on the adaptation, finance, and some of the solutions for unlocking and mobilizing adaptation finance, um, 
first for particularly here in the Caribbean, the use of domestic revenue mobilization is something that I think is is not likely to happen in a really significant way, simply because we don't have the fiscal space and we're really heavily indebted countries. Uh, I think at the last count, about six Caribbean countries were already well beyond 100% of GDP in terms of their public debt ratios and their debt servicing has jumped tremendously. Um, we talk about the private sector and the role of the private sector in in contributing to climate finance. Um, globally, the private sector has around US $2 trillion in assets. And there's really a limited amount that actually goes to climate finance. Um, we, we really don't see that happening. And then part of it is that the region, even if we talk about the Caribbean, uh, but it's also applicable in general to developing countries that it's very hard to get bankable projects that the private sector would say, I am seeing sufficient returns that I would want to invest in. I think um, you said you're working on the on in the energy sector side. So I'm, I'm sure you're seeing that also, also taking place. And it means then we have to start thinking about things. Again, I mean, is a discussion around um, foreign exchange guarantees, uh, interest rate subsidies. These are the kind of things I would need to see. How do we lower the cost of capital, right, for these projects? The I like the idea in terms of, uh, you know, possibly looking at the diaspora and remittance flows. Um, but the remittance flows are still very small and the more survival flows in terms of supporting countries' balance of payments. What I would suggest is then we you look we look more wider to the the diaspora assets, the diaspora wealth in terms of how you leverage that because beyond the flows themselves, from a stock perspective, the diaspora actually has a large amount mm -hmm. of savings that could be mobilized. So I think that's something that we should definitely look at and again all this just comes back down to reform of the global financial architecture it comes back to what prime minister mia motley has been articulated for some time and now expressed through the bridgetown initiatives um uh, then uh in terms of the loss and damage um just some comments around the fact that you know the yes the discussions uh with the transitional committee was at times um extremely extremely um I, let me just say engaging <laughs> right to the point where people were about to walk out the room but there are some things i mean sometimes the way how the message comes out because it, it, it we so while we say well we were against the world bank um being the host and trustee but the thing is that's all it's gonna be right it is not there is a separate governance arrangement in terms of an independent secretariat that is reporting not to the World Bank, but is reporting to COP. Right? So it is still within the it is still within the UN system. And these sort of arrangements are actually not new. I mean, the, the G24, the group of 24, which represents developing countries with respect to IMF World Bank issues, is actually housed in the IMF. Right? And gets um, some sort of support from the IMF, but it has its own independent secretariat and reports to ministers of finance, right, of the G24 countries. And we also have right now the V20, the vulnerable group of 20, looking to become officially recognized by the IMF and therefore to be housed as well possibly within the IMF, but again, they're going to be independent because it has its own secretariat. So sometimes, you know, we, we sort of get caught in the, in the thing in a lot of the discussions that's happening and the, the global South, global North divide without going sometimes into, let's see what has actually been agreed and if some of this might make sense. Um, and then just, this is just my view now regarding Santiago Network and the fact that the CDB has put its hat into the ring. Frankly, the CDB is not an efficient institution, right? I think we were all surprised some months ago when Ajay Banga said that the World Bank takes 27 months, right, to get a project out the door. 
Do you know how long it takes for the CDB to get a project out the door? Definitely longer than the bull bank. All right. So while I mean, if we may say, well, yeah, this is our Caribbean institution, and we're proud to have this institution, right? Manage, um, be the part as part of the Santiago network. Unless that institution could really ramp up its operational efficiency, it will be doing a disservice to all the developing countries, including the ones in the Caribbean. And so thanks very much for giving me some time to make these um, comments. And again, fantastic discussions from both presenters. Thanks a lot for you know sharing your insights as well, uh, Mr. Ambran. And of course, we appreciate that you know this platform facilitate discussions on these issues. So I'm not sure if any of our presenters would like to you know respond to anything or add any comment. Um, if not, we could also you know facilitate another question from the attendees. Sure. Um, I'm not sure if you want to take a group of questions or if we should respond one time. Um, you should, should, should respond, respond one time? time. Yes, yes, you can. Um, Sasha, you want to go first or should I should I go ahead? No, no, go ahead. Talk an adaptation. Okay. <laughs> no problem. The, the couple, couple, couple of things. Um, first of all, thanks so much for, for being here. Thanks for your comments. Um, definitely understand what you said about domestic expenditure, and it it is really constrained, particularly for the most vulnerable countries. They don't have much to work with anyway. Um, so, but again, I mean, some the some countries may have a bit more fiscal room than others. Even some developing countries may have some some more fiscal room than others because. At different stages, but the the overall picture for domestic expenditure is not really good. Um, but we, I, I don't think we should ever exclude it as a source. But I understand exactly what you just said. Um, with regard to the private sector, however, um, that you made some really good points. I just want to add on to what you said that there are some sectors within the private sector, in particular, where it's in their interest to to see the to see that money flowing from their companies. Uh, towards these bankable projects and towards climate finance. Um, I mean, I've said this before, I don't think that in particular, for example, I don't think there is a sustainable point, Lisa, without hydrogen, for example, or without projects like hydrogen that make it future-proof. You understand? So it's in the interest of all of these companies that, by the way, have lots of money and I don't want to quantify it I nearly quantified it um but it's in the interest of some of these companies to invest that money there tourism is very similar um we will definitely begin to see as as this becomes more and more of a headline issue in particular um we definitely begin to see tourists from these exotic destinations um or, or that view us as like as exotic destinations we see those tourists maybe cool off their demand for these long haul flights. Um, because there's more and more skepticism about, about offsetting. Um, and the flights are already expensive. Um, and there are more there there are other destinations that they can possibly go to that will do um that are less carbon intensive. So it's in the interest of of, of aviation, it's in the interest of 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 many tourism destinations across the world to begin to put some money into bankable projects. Um, and certainly there are lots of insurance gains and insurance losses in this field. Um, the insurance industry is responding very interestingly, even in Trinidad, to climate impacts. I mean, I, I mean, we're not good on that rabbit hole, um, but the, there is an incentive um, in the financial services arena to move. And, and I think we need, to, we need to capitalize on some of those. I think in the Caribbean we're already seeing some some traction and some movement as related really to hydrogen. Um, not just for, for Trinidad and Tobago, but also hydrogen from geothermal energy. I think that's really important. But I what you said about bankability is 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 is, is going to be the cost of the issue for many of these projects and de-risking those projects. Um, I'm only going to say two things about. I'm going to let Sasha respond on the other part of the equation. But I would say for for the listeners. Uh, for, for this make sure everybody understands why we we talking about the World Bank as much as we are. That's a geopolitical issue, right? Um, just in, in blast tax, it is who actually has 
group influence in the World Bank. Who gets to choose the president? It's it's a it's a it's more a geopolitical question for for many people. But there are other issues in terms of that administrative fee that 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 Sasha talked about. That's about one billion dollars. That's not a small fee. Um, when when you're talking about depending on how this thing is capitalized, right? Um, and then the other thing that the last thing I'd say is, I hear you on the CDB. Um, when I was doing my PhD and that was about ten years. Oh my gosh, ten years ago. I I I feel old. Um, when I was doing my PhD, they used to refer the CDB as the lender of last resort. Um, and uh, I don't know if the CDB will get better. Just quite frankly if we don't entrust it with huge tasks, I think it needs to get better through practice. And that's, I think that's going to be the brass tax. And I think getting resources in from all over the world and accompanied by a global spotlight can actually help us to develop the operational efficiency that you talk about, but not just that, the institutional knowledge in terms of how we get this done within the global South. I think we, I mean, you hear people say we have to start from somewhere. It's true. Um, and, uh, I mean, we, we might be bad, but we ain't backward. You know, it, there is a way of, of of us getting this done. I mean, I certainly have the confidence that we can we can turn, turn something, we can make some changes um, if required and if the spotlight is on us because we've done it in the past. Like we've definitely stepped up to the occasion when required. Um, I'm going to stop there. Miss um, um, Jatin Singh, over to you. <laughs> no problem. Thanks so much, um, Karen and, and Joala as well for your comments. Um, yes, definitely. I would say the the negotiations on, you know, from the, the transitional committee has been very heated, at times very entertaining, <laughs> because it could almost come to blues, right? Um, because what you were saying is that that the the basically the recommendations and and so and the negotiations were split fundamentally on philosophical lines right so the fact that we were able to meet to have recommendations and have even though people might think it's a compromise text the fact that before they had to have you know two extra meetings just to reach this i i would say is a, a breakthrough and um you know, at the at the fourth TC meeting when the the um US was like, you all better take the World Bank or leave it. We have the um, you know, negotiator from Antigua and Barbuda is like, well, this is pure gangster behavior. <laughs> she was my former boss, so this is this is how she would speak, regardless. I expect nothing less. But but it was very heated, and um, and even though you know it is going to the World Bank is going to be interim host and trustee. It's important that developing countries were able to put conditions on that. They have to, and this is why negotiations are very important. Because if it is that we need to that that the World Bank is going to be the host, you will have to meet certain conditions to make sure that it meets the needs for developing countries. And I think the the fight or, or argument shouldn't be on whether the World Bank is, is there, but what those conditions are. And are those conditions still going to be to form part of the, the COP decision that will be agreed? Because I think that's quite important. And um, in terms of the Caribbean Development Bank, um, I, I, I definitely hear what you're saying um, on, on how efficient and effective they are in terms of resource. Um, but but um, resource mobilization and, and so forth. But I think if they now have, you know, this huge responsibility entrusted from the COP and all, what, 198 countries um, to the UNFCCC, that means that they have to do better and they have to improve their, um, their operational procedures and policies to, to make that happen and then also they are accountable to the cop they have to provide reports every year on whether they're actually doing their job or not so i think this is one way that we will force we could force the the um the cdb to become more responsive and um in the same way the loss and damage fund that will be housed on an interim basis at the world bank is one way to force reform 
on World Bank policies and procedures as well, because you have this set of conditions that developing countries need. So it's it's it, it could happen, and you were seeing this happening, but instead of it being done, you know, it's being done from within, now that we have this loss and damage, well, the recommendation is for the loss and damage fund to be um, housed within the World Bank um, on an interim basis. So I think that those are huge developments and it'll be, it'll be interesting to see what happens and what's the outcome of that further on. Because it's not so, just so anymore. Sorry, go, go on. No, sorry, please continue. I thought you had finished. No, no, I am, um, I am. Um, All right, sorry about you, that. No, 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 we have really please. appreciated We'll have to soak me a motley on the CDB. <laughs> Thanks so much for doing, sorry, those insightful comments. So we welcome any other, you know, attendee who would like to ask a question. Please feel free to raise your hands. I'm sure there is someone, you know, with another question or comment or maybe interested in, in clarifying something that any of the presenters what I've said, but while I wait for the next, you know, brave individual to start, okay, we have a question. Um, no, no. Okay, no, it was just so. So there has there have been a discussion going on, um, in the comment section where Miss Noel would have asked, you know, if there was any connection between the just transit policy and um you know, the loss and damage, the issue of loss and damage. And I believe Karen would have added some comments there, but if you like Karen, or, um, sorry, Dr. Niles, or Ms. Jatan Singh, you all could feel free to, to you Karen know, elaborate right. as well on that, yes. Yeah, yeah, Karen, Karen, and I, I want to encourage this, we have a, a few more minutes, um, and but but I want to encourage this to ask as many questions as, 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 you, as you desire, because it's an important issue and it's good for us to have a really clear understanding of these issues. The just transition largely refers to um, how we, this is very close to my PhD topic, how we move from one be, state of being to another state of being. So that's, so how we move from uh, where we are right now, which is economies very dependent on fossil fuels um, to more carbon neutral, carbon negative, um, or sus let's put it like this, a more sustainable energy base. Um, but in in transitioning from, from where we are now to where we need to be in terms of our sustainable energy systems, um, some people may be put out of work. Um, you can think of coal miners, you think of many persons that are employed in oil and gas in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, think about what happened when Petrochem closed. You know, um, so... Uh, it's about thinking about these people from the front before the transition actually takes place, right? And so, and so that's the conversation that's happening in the chat. Um, Mr. Robinson, Nelsia, uh, she yes, said... Yes, I see that's a very interesting yeah. question in the chat. Yeah, here. for sure. Um, do you want to take that one, um, Sasha? Sure. So, um, so the well, from Ms. Robinson, remember there is a distrust of World Bank from structural adjustment challenges. This trust has to be this this distrust has to be resolved from the high level of negotiation. How are CSOs involved? So, in terms of of how the the transitional committee work um, throughout the year, um, observers, including civil society organizations, have been invited to provide submissions on um on what the loss and damage fund should look like, what should the eligibility criteria be, what it should fund, and then also submissions from CSOs on what are loss and damages affecting communities and countries. Um, so we've had the submissions from, you know, especially from SIDS in the Pacific. Unfortunately, I don't think there's been any submissions from um, Caribbean civil society and um, on this issue. So it could mean that we have to do better in how do we engage CSOs here in the Caribbean to, to be able to now um, start participating more in these, um, in these negotiations, e either through providing um, submission or information, submissions or information to feed into the negotiation process. 
Wow. Um, so, Karan, um, I think the doctor and I think there, I know you said it's fine with both, but um, there is also a question which I believe that you would like to tackle. There any comments, actually? Yeah, I, I see that. I have a meeting with the principal in like three minutes, so I'm going to do my best. Um, the. <laughs> Whoa, one side note thing that, I mean, the specific is transparency. Uh, Sasha, I, I, I do think it, it might be good to, to talk about on another occasion. Uh, for, for CSOs, maybe have another session. I don't think CSOs were allowed in the negotiations. That's a kind of thing to talk about later um, at some point in time, but also how we actually maybe talk to the Carpet Foundation directly about how Caribbean CSOs are represented and can, can be. Um, about the question here, how would we make low carbon energy products bankable in TNT? I would say, and this is going to be a controversial statement before we had to go, um, the increasing of electricity prices is a welcome change um, to help making them more bankable, just plain to our bad manners. Um, not having this artificial bubble around us that subsidizes everything so that we never pay the true cost of anything, that actually helps make things more bankable. By the way, water might be on the agenda at some point in time. So, and, and the, the thing about it, when I talk about, about the prices of utilities in, in Trinidad, around the world, people are just like, that's crazy. And you would think that we're living in heaven, but life is still hard in Trinidad. The cost of living still feels high, you know? So it's, and it's going to become a bit more, um, it's going to become a bit more, uh, it's going to get a little bit worse where, where that is concerned if if we are going to face the real cost of them in that. So number one, um, removing some of the unhelpful subsidies do help to make projects um, more bankable. The, number two is we actually have a lot of capacity in Trinidad to implement very, very complex projects. So that's really good. That's very, very helpful. So, uh, uh, and that's because a lot of those persons are already working in the oil and gas sector. So, Part of it is going to be how we transition the skill and talent that we have to other industries. Part of that equation is going to be how we package our energy services and, and the skills and, and the talent that we have from the energy sector to other sectors. And I think that's going to be very, very important in terms of making some of these projects bankable, right? Um, yeah, so and project financing, very similar. We also have a lot of skilled professionals that have done a lot of project financing work. It's about transitioning that 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 talent pool to other projects as well. I think it, it can be done, particularly in the case of, of hydrogen and Trinidad and Tobago. I don't think that's I, I don't think that's uh a hamstring. Yeah. So it's it's about seeing oh uh, that umbilical that you talked about, um, not just as a problem and as a huge problem but seeing it also as an opportunity. Great, so I think that is a great point to end our webinar. And today we thank you very much for taking time to join us. You know, you have a very important meeting now and we also thank um, Mr. Tansing for taking time to join us this afternoon. Um, as I would have said earlier on, all the resources in terms of presentations as well as the recording of the entire session will be made available. Um, yes, we're seeing some thanks as well in the comments. Be sure to follow Caribou on all the social media network, or sorry, social media sites. And I can tease that we have a very, 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 very um, interesting webinar coming up to close off the year. Um, so stay tuned for that. We will send out um, information on that in the coming days. And we really know that you will enjoy this one. It's very interesting. So thanks so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day and continue to keep up to date with Caribou on all these social media sites. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> thanks enjoy a lot. Bye. 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 Bye.